Well, hello, Chapel Street Church, and wherever you're tuning in from, we're so glad you've chosen to worship with us this morning. You know, if you've been paying attention to some of our social media posts, you are aware that we ask you to join us in prayer for students, kids, children, and for parents, as this week and week and next week are the weeks that school is beginning, at least in this part of the, of the country. And so many of you have kids, and you know all about that. I don't have to tell you, and there's a lot of prayer going on. But I thought, before we begin, we would offer a prayer for teachers. There are many wonderful teachers that are part of our church family, many of you watching. I know our teachers, and so we want to just pause and ask God's blessing, not just for the students and for the parents, but also for those who will be teaching them and guiding them throughout the year. So let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we pause now and just give you thanks for the teachers in our church family, in our communities, and all around this country. Those who have chosen as their profession to invest in the young lives, to nurture them, to teach them, to guide them. We ask, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and grace for every teacher as they prepare to lead their class each day. Equip them for every good work you have prepared ahead of time for them to do. Protect them. Keep them healthy and safe and strong and motivated. That your strength would fill them. That you would enable them to do all they do with a heart of compassion and grace that comes straight from you, from you Lord. Give them ability and effectiveness as they teach. Fill them with creativity and passion for this very important role you've called them to. Give them joy in every day, but especially in the times when they grow weary and feel unappreciated. In the moments when they feel like there's just not enough time to do all they need to do, multiply their hours and give success to their efforts, for we know that you're able to do more in a day than we ever could. Remind all those who lead, teach, and serve in all of our schools, in whatever capacity, that they have the incredible opportunity to make a difference in the life of a child every single day. Surround their families and their personal lives in your care, protection. Provide abundantly for every need they have. Help them to release every concern and anxiety to your hand, believing that you're able to do all things. Love through them. Shine on them. Pour out your blessing and favor over them throughout the year. In the name of Jesus, our great teacher, we pray. Amen. We just love all of you who teach, and we pray for you, not just now, but as we go forward. Well, today, we launch into the second to last uh, week of our series called Seven, the Churches of Revelation, studying these seven letters to seven churches in Asia Minor, looking at God's letters to these historic churches, not just the churches, but also his letter to the church at all times everywhere throughout the world, including our church, the, us today. These letters are very personal and very relevant for our situation today. I've got some friends who are pastors of churches in California where they, uh, I'm friends with them. We get together a couple times a year to encourage each other and learn from each other. And around here, recently, as many of you know, we had a series of uh, tornadoes and thunderstorms, pretty severe in some parts of uh, in our region pretty close to us. I sent some pictures and videos of tornadoes to my friends in California and said, you have earthquakes and fires but we have tornadoes. And we were debating via text thread, uh, which was worse. Is it worse, which is scarier? What do you think? Is it scarier for, for to face an earthquake or a tornado? Personally, I think it's an earthquake. I mean, the earth opens up. What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna go? Oh, they said, no, no, that's just a little rattling. The, the pictures rattle, no big deal. But tornadoes, those are terrifying. I mean, the sky's coming to get you. But then we agreed, well, the combination of earthquakes and wildfires you know, that's probably worse. We both suffer in Illinois and California from the plague of high taxes, but they have earthquakes and wildfires. We just have tornadoes. Anyway, I say all that to say that earthquakes were relatively common in Asia Minor uh, in the ancient world. In fact, the city we're going to be looking at, the city of Philadelphia, the letter to the church in the city of Philadelphia, was ravaged by earthquakes numerous times. In fact, about 50 years before this letter was written, the entire city was destroyed, leveled. All the massive temples to pagan gods were crumbled to the ground, and it all had to be rebuilt. In fact, Tiberius Caesar helped to rebuild the city on his own, by his, uh, his own financial investment. And so the city of Philadelphia renamed itself, uh, you know, in honor of Tiberius as the Neo-Caesarea, the New Caesar in other words. They changed their name, actually, to honor and thank the Caesar who helped rebuild their city. The city also was known as kind of a, a missionary outpost for what's known as Hellenism. That Hellenism means Greek culture. So Philadelphia, because of where it was located on a major highway through Asia Minor, became sort of an outpost for the spread of Greek culture, which the Romans were serious about. Greek philosophy, Greek language, Greek uh, religions, uh, pagan religions, and so on, and, and just the whole cultural atmosphere called Hellenism, it was this outpost to spread that. So Jesus writes to this church uh, at the, in this city that had been destroyed by earthquakes, that was an outpost for pagan Hellenism, and all this background is to help us understand what he's saying to the church then and really to the church now. So let's look at this letter. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. 
and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you because you've kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is such an amazing, I say this about every letter, but this is such an amazing letter and really so relevant for us if we understand what he's saying. Now in, in this letter, we're going to see some things or characteristics about the church, this particular church and the church in general, some truths about who Jesus is. We're always looking for those, and some promises that he makes to his church then and now. One of the first things we see about this particular church in Philadelphia is that Jesus says about them, I know that you have but little power. So they were the church of little power. How'd you like that? What if we had that on the sign, new name? Not Chapel Street, but the church of little power. Uh, what kind of a name would that be? To be known as the church of little power. What does he mean? The word means strength or significance, even influence. Jesus is saying, I know that in the world's eyes, you don't amount to much. You don't count for much. You don't have much strength or wealth or power or influence. This is interesting to think about this. This church has very little worldly status. Nobody's writing articles about them, podcasting about them, blogging about them. They're not on the radar. They don't show up in the outreach magazine's top 100 fastest growing churches. They have little power, little influence. Yet, Despite their lack of size and influence and power or strength, we see two things about them. They kept his word, and they did not deny his name. Now, you have to stop and think about that for just a minute. So they have little power, but they kept his word and did not deny his name? How can a church with no power keep the word of God when they're being attacked and pressured? How can a church with no power stay faithful to the name of Jesus when they're being pressured and threatened into denying his name and bending the knee to Caesar. They were, they had some power. They had some strength, just not the kind of strength or power the world recognizes. You might put it this way. They were weak enough to know the strength of Jesus, to know the strength of his grace. This is precisely what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So they were weak enough to know his power. You know, I've been thinking about this as it relates to us, to our church, and to the church in the world today. Our church, I would not say is a church of little power. But we do have, I think, a reputation and influence, and that's not all bad. But I think it comes down to this. You can have the power and influence on the world's terms, or we can have the spiritual power and influence of the God's Spirit. But you really can't have both. Let me say that again. You can have power and influence on the world's terms, or we can have the spiritual power and influence of God's Spirit, but you cannot have both. Too often, I think churches in affluent parts of the world, particularly in America, are trying to have both. I think we've been guilty of that at times, trying to have both, and, and it really comes down to a choice. The reality is most of us don't experience the kind of spiritual power and strength that the church in Philadelphia had because we don't live lives that require it. If we're brutally honest, we don't live the kind of lives that require it. Lives of personal witness, of evangelism and talking about the love of Christ, lives that speak out into the culture against immorality, that speak out against evil and injustice in all of its forms. Lives that are unapologetic about the name of Jesus require some kind of strength. Not the power the world recognizes, as Jesus says, you have but little power, yet I see this. You've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. Part of the secret of their power and their spiritual strength, and ours, quite frankly, is knowing who Jesus really is. 
I mean, if we're going to keep his word and hold fast to his name, then who is he, really? And really, if you look through all of these letters, all seven of them, that's one of the primary things Jesus is saying over and over and over again. He's identifying who he is to that church and to its specific need and to us as the church everywhere all the time. Who is this we're committed to following? That's one of the key things we're studying. Clear and certain confidence of who Jesus is, specifically in the face of opposition. So let's look at a couple of things that Jesus says about who he is, identifies, how he identifies himself for the church in Philadelphia and for us. First, he's the Holy One and the True One. Jesus says, I am the Holy One and the True One. Holy One, what does that mean? We don't use that phrase. Uh, it, it's an Old Testament reference to an, a couple of passages, many passages. Jesus identifies himself throughout the Old Testament as the Holy One of Israel. What he's saying here is, I am God himself. There is no other God. Jesus is not one God among many gods. He's the Holy One uh, and, and the True One. Let's look at Isaiah 43, verse 15, Isaiah 40, verse 25. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like Him, says the Holy One. There's no one like me. I'm it. I'm Him. I am the Holy One, the True God, and there's no other God. Now, this flies in the face of cult, our, our sort of popular opinion today, which is Jesus is... You know, he's an he's amazing teacher, but he's really not all that different fundamentally from Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or any wise spiritual le religious leader. They're all really saying basically different versions of the same thing. Jesus is saying, no, there's only one, and you're looking at him. I'm he, the holy one, the true one. True meaning not fake, not false, the real deal, in other words. Jesus identified himself to this church of little power that he's the true God, the authentic God. And then we learn this. Jesus holds the keys. He says, I hold the keys of David. Now that's an Old Testament reference again, an allusion to a story out of Isaiah 22 where a, a priest named Eliakim is given the keys of David. It's a symbol of authority throughout the Old and New Testaments. The keys are symbols of authority and they're presented to him. And Eliakim is kind of a type of Christ. Jesus will say, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me in Matthew 28. In Matthew chapter 16, he says, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. He has authority that he can bestow on his followers. So here he's saying to the church in Philadelphia, uh, holding the keys, meaning all authority belongs to him. There's nothing he can't unlock. And that leads us to the second thing, right? That Jesus opens doors. Now, obviously the guy with the keys is the guy who can open the doors. He says, I've set before you an open door. Uh, you know, when I was in college, um, there was a guy named Clarence Edwards. We all called him C-Train. He's rather, rather famous in Wheaton College circles. Uh, and he's still around today. He's, he's, he's timeless. Uh, he was the guy who was the equipment manager, custodian. Uh, he, he was a jack of all trades. But he was the guy who had all the keys. You wanted to be C-Train's friend. Because no matter what you were doing, you wanted to get in. And he could get you in to the equipment room, to the weight room, to the gym, to play a late night game and pick up basketball. If he liked you, he could let you in anywhere because he had all the keys. So the point is, you want to know the guy with the keys. And Jesus is saying to this church of little power, I'm the guy with all the keys. You want to know me. And I, here's the great news. He wants to know you. He wants to know us. That's the meaning of the open door. When Jesus says, I've set before you an open door, what's he talking about? What, what's the door? Is it a door of mission opportunity? Many scholars think he's saying this church of little power in this city that was a missionary outpost, there's, a, there's an irony here. Jesus is saying, actually, the open door is not for Hellenism, it's for the gospel. I'm going to open the door of the gospel through you to the world. And that's true. He is opening the door of opportunity for gospel ministry and impact, for influence in your neighborhood, in your school, on your street, in your home, in your city. But there's something else going on. Jesus is also saying there's an open door for relationship, an open door to the kingdom. Jesus himself says in John chapter 10 that he's the door through which we enter, that all enter in through him. It's an open door of invitation to a relationship with God, what we call the kingdom, to become sons and daughters of the king. Jesus says, think about this, to this, this church of little significance. I have opened the door for you to come into a relationship with me. And it's in that relationship that I'll open the door to the world to you, to, pr to proclaim my name, to talk about my glory and my love and my grace. It's amazing to think about this. The Holy One, the true God, who holds all the keys, has opened the door to you and to me, to come in, to call us his children, 
his sons and daughters, to make us his church, his body, a temple in which he dwells by his spirit. Jesus, friends, opens the door to you. Will you enter in? Why wouldn't you? It's the doorway to grace and forgiveness and mercy and freedom and joy and purpose. It's the door of doors, right? Now, I think many of us, we spend our lives banging on the wrong doors, trying to knock down doors and unlock doors. And Jesus says, I, anything I open, no one can shut. And what I shut, no one can open. What a tragedy to come to the end of our life and find out I've been trying to bust my way through the wrong doors when the door that matters is open to me. And it's the one Jesus is talking about right now. Maybe in your own life, there's a door of your career or some relationship or something you're, you're trying to force your way into. And you're going to find, Jesus says, the door that matters, I have opened to you. And these doors that you think matter, they're not what I have for you. Keys, he has, that means all authority. Doors, all access, right? All access pass. The, the guy with the keys says, I'm with you. I love you. I, I set before you an open door. Will you enter in? That's what Jesus is saying to this church of little power and to us. Now, in verse 9, uh, we're told that he's, he, there's the synagogue of Satan reference which is a little confusing. But refer back to chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and we talked about the church at Smyrna. We saw, again, the, this idea of the synagogue of Satan. Just in brief, you can go back and listen to that or research it on your own, but just briefly, we won't get into it in detail here. It's a group of Jews, Jewish descendants, they were Jewish by culture and heritage and birth, who were not uh, faithful to God and did not recognize Jesus as Messiah and actually were hostile to the gospel and hostile to the church and Christianity in the first century. That's why he says they're Jews, but they're really not. He says that he's going to do something. He's going to uh, vindicate the church in Philadelphia by his love. He says those people who oppose you will one day recognize that I have loved you. Think about that. They will learn that I've loved you. He's not going to vindicate them by wrath and judgment and punishment. The judgment day will come, but that's not what he says here. He says they're going to know that I've loved you. They're going to come and bow down because they recognize my love and grace among you. That's fascinating. What does it mean to be vindicated by the love of God? Well, there's an Old Testament prophetic reference here in a couple of places to Isaiah chapter 60, verse 14, which reads, The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, and they shall know that you are his beloved. So, it's a play on Old Testament prophetic reference here that people who oppose you will eventually come to recognize that God loves you. So they'll see his love on display. And I think it's also echoing what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 when he says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, one day, someday, there will be no more atheists or agnostics. Someday, every knee Every tongue, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, everyone will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some will do it willingly, joyfully in worship. Others will do it grudgingly because they have to acknowledge the one they've rejected is the true God. And I think what Jesus says to this church here in Philadelphia is, he's going to make it obvious in their time that he loves them. By how he guides them, how he blesses them and provides for them. I'll put it to you this way. This church of little power. It is not the size of the church or the greatness of its ministries that matter. It's the size of the Savior and the greatness of his love that really matters. You know, as a pastor, sometimes I have to remind myself of this more often than I like to admit. It is not the size of the church or the greatness and influence in the world's eyes of the ministry that matters. It's the size of the Savior and the greatness of his love. That's what matters. That's the power. I was going to ask you, do you know how great his love is for you? Do you have any idea how much he loves you? The Holy One of Israel, the true one who holds the keys, who opens doors, that God, do you have any concept of how much he loves you? My guess is if you're like me, sometimes you question it. Sometimes in the back of your mind or deep in the recesses of your soul, you wonder if it's true for you. You can believe it for other people, but you wonder if it, if it really applies to you. He does. He does. And I recently, I read a book, actually last year, 
well, during COVID. I can't remember. All the time runs together probably for you as well. I don't know when for sure I read it, but it was sometime in the last 18 months. Called Gentle and Lowly by an author named Dane Ortland, about the heart of God revealed in Christ and the Old Testament. The very heart of who Jesus is, is gentle and lowly and loving and kind and gracious. Like, there's lots of characteristics, but that's at his essence who he is. He's love. We see it in the Old Testament in Exodus 34, verse 6, when God appears to Moses, there's the pronouncement, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And one of my favorite verses from the minor prophet Zephaniah, the Lord your God is in your midst, and he is mighty to save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. I love that verse. Think about that just for a minute. The love of God rejoices over you in gladness and quiets you. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it's like to have God rejoice over you with gladness? If you're wondering what that means, just watch any, any new parent rejoicing over their baby with gladness, beaming with pride and joy. Do you know that's how God looks at you if you're in Christ? Rejoices over you. My daughter, my son. Or, or, or maybe you need to hear, he will quiet you with his love. What a phrase that is for our current cultural moment. He will quiet your anxiousness. He will quiet your fearfulness about the future. He will quiet your anger and resentment toward people who don't agree with you or believe like you believe. He, he will quiet your, your constant pressing and, and churning and needing to prove yourself. He will quiet your drive and perfectionistic tendencies. He will quiet the voices of shame and, and regret that always speak in the back of your mind. Isn't it great to know God loves you and he, he wants to demonstrate his love to you by rejoicing over you with gladness and by quieting your heart and calming your fears. It's his love that sustains us in trial and in pain and in persecution. And that's precisely what he's saying here to this church in Philadelphia and to us. Let's look at verse 10 for a minute. Excuse me, one more verse there, verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance... I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Now, this is a verse that's often quoted and referred to and cited. Let's talk about it for a minute. What is this hour of trial that's coming, which Jesus says he's going to keep us or them from? How does it apply to us? What's he talking about? Well, there's uh, many who believe this is a reference to the growing, increasing, intense persecution in the first century by the Roman Caesars against Christians. And certainly, it, it certainly applies to that. There are others who think this is some future time of tribulation and suffering that the church will be exempt from. There are those who say it's a general reference to throughout the world at all times when the church is persecuted and suffers. Here's the important point. The Bible does not teach an escapist theology, like we're exempt from trial. It teaches a perseverance in joy and patience theology. The promise for spiritual protection in the midst of physical trial, it's not the promise of removal from physical trial. In fact, the Bible says exactly the opposite over and over and over again. We're not promised exemption. Do, do, think about it. Do you really think, do we really, how presumptuous is it to think, well, we're going to be exempt from trial. When our brothers and sisters in Christ, in, right now today, in places like Syria and Iran and China and North Korea and Indonesia, are suffering unspeakable persecutions. And throughout history, this has gone on. Why, why do we think we get some sort of pass on this? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I will keep you in that trial, spiritual preservation, spiritual protection in the midst of the trial. A couple of verses here that come to mind. Revelation 2, verse 10. Jesus says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And then in, the, in Revelation 12, and they, they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. They conquered how? By the blood and the testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Jesus says it this way in John chapter 16, verses 33 and 17, verse 5. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Did you hear that? You will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Now we can talk about the degree to which that happens in different parts of the church, in different parts of the world, but it's a promise. It's a statement. And in 17 verse 5, 
And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Glorify me in your own presence. God is saying, Jesus is saying, bring us into his presence. And later he'll go on to say, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you unify them in me and with each other in the world. And then in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. We enter the kingdom of God through tribulation, through suffering and trial, our own and ultimately through his. So the promise over and over again is not escapist. Let me say it this way. Our victory is not in escaping tribulation, but it is in remaining faithful unto death. Our victory is not in escaping tribulation, but it is in remaining faithful unto death. This is why it matters so much that we keep his word and we worship his name. So that we're prepared to face the trials that, that may come upon us. Okay, so this church of little power uh, has kept his word. They've been faithful to his name because he's the holy one, the true one. Uh, he holds the keys. He opens the doors of his kingdom to us. And then lastly, there's three promises Jesus gives to his church. Not just then, but to you and to me, to us right now. So we've seen who Jesus is in, in brief. We've seen how this church, what they're doing, who they are. And now what does Jesus promise to his church at all times? So three promises. Uh, he says, first of all, uh, in chapter, let's read verses 11 through 12 of chapter 3. Do we have that? Well, let's look at the promises. Let's do that. How about that? His presence. He promises his presence. He promises us his permanence. And he promises us his personal possession. We'll go through these. They come to us out of Revelation 3, verses 11 through 12. And show you, oh, do we not have that one? Let's go back a couple slides. There we are. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven and on my own new name. In this text, we see these three promises. Now we'll look at them again, each in, in turn. Jesus promises us his presence, power and comfort. He says, I'm coming soon. Now, when, he, when, when in the Bible, when Jesus says I'm coming soon, it's one of two things. Very often when Jesus says I'm coming soon, it's a, it's a warning for those that are ignoring him, denying him and living however they want. I'm coming soon and I'm going to deal with you. But that's not what it says, means here. He's saying, I'm going to be with you. Security, comfort, presence in the midst of your trial. The promise of his presence. In fact, this is how the, the book of Revelation ends. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And we say, amen, come Lord Jesus. The second to last verse of the entire Bible ends with, come Lord Jesus. Claiming that promise that he is coming to be with us. That he is with us. Second, his permanence. There's this phrase where he says, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and you'll never go out of it. Now think about this. They live in a city that in their lifetime was destroyed by an earthquake where all the pillars of the great temples were turned to rubble. And they live in a city where they, are, they have no power, they have no massive structure, no, they, met in, they met in hiding probably in house churches. They didn't have a temple, they didn't have a, a great building to call their own, and they'd seen great temples destroyed. Jesus says, I'm going to make you Permanent pillars, immovable, rock solid, certain, permanent. Nothing can move you or shake you if you're in Christ, is what he's saying. And then finally, he says, his personal possession. Three things he says, I'm going to write on you the name of my God. This is a beautiful promise. I'm going to write the name of my God on you. Remember when you were a kid and you had to label all your stuff for school? Remember you had to label your pencil box or whatever, your trapper keeper? That's dating me a little bit. I don't, I don't think those exist anymore. Or your folders. Or even my mom made me label my clothes. You know, put your initials in your tags of your clothing. You know, label, you label everything. So you know it's yours. Isn't that, this is what Jesus is saying. I'm going to write on you that you belong to me. The name of my God. This one's mine. This one's mine. This one's mine. And then he says, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. That you, you, you have a, a pass into the great city of God, his kingdom. And then he says, I'm going to write my own new name on you. These are all three ways of saying this exact same thing. 
We belong to God. The promise is that you're going to have his presence, you're going to have his permanence, and you're going to be his possession, personal possession. You belong to him. He's written his name on us. Wouldn't you like to know that's true? Wouldn't you like to know that whatever comes this next year, your whole life long, that you belong to God, that he's written his name on you, that he loves you with an everlasting love, that nothing can take that or shake that? That's the power of this church of little power. And frankly, no matter how large or small, how significant or insignificant a church may be in the world's eyes, that's the only power we have as his people. There is no other significance or power we may have. And then I'll just read this from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. And you, meaning the church, show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us. Now think about that. Jesus is writing a letter to Christians, but we today are his letter from Jesus. The way that we live, we're a letter from Christ written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So we're reading this ancient letter, right? But the beautiful truth is you and I, the people of God today, are meant to be a letter that God has written on our hearts, his love and his law, his gospel truth, that the way that we live might be a letter to the world, that as they see our lives, they might read something of the goodness and love of God. Oh, let it be true of us, of you and of me and of all of us, what Jesus said of the church of Philadelphia, that we have kept his word and we have not denied his name. Let's pray. God, thank you for this ancient letter which feels like it speaks right to our moment, right to our hearts. Thank you that you're the Holy One and the True One. There's no other God but you, that you hold all keys and, all, and open all doors. Thank you that you have opened the door to life in, in, in your kingdom to us. Thank you that you've invited us in and praise you, God, that you promise us your presence, that you make us permanent, that we'll never be moved, and that we are your own personal possession. We give you all the praise and glory. King Jesus, we pray in your name. Thank Amen. You, Anton. How wonderful it is to reflect and repeat over and over again God's great love for us. And as we go out from here, I want to bless you to go in the strength and power that comes from God's great love for us. Bless you, church. Have a great week.